So Christ is risen. Oh, that's a good strong one there. A good strong word. So that he is indeed. And I, I love our gospel lesson today because I don't know if you caught it. There's something kind of interesting that's happening in the gospel lesson that when the tomb, women go to the tomb, an unexpected thing happens. The whole earth shakes like this. It's almost like this earth shaking because of the change is so severe that the earth can't even contain it anymore. There's just shaking all around them. It's, and it just, this earthquake comes and it causes the guards to feel and the angel says, Jesus isn't here, that Christ is risen. The old earth shakes because it's literally turning the world upside down that we see that blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who are low, right? Like that's everything is turning upside down. And our reading, the second reading that Kevin read a little bit ago, the, the one from Acts, that reading there. Now, I have to be honest with you. I have to be honest with you. When we were first putting together the service, I wanted to read all of Acts chapter 10. But I could already hear your voices going, boy, that was a long reading, Pastor. And like, that's like, what do you, what do you think you're doing? Like, that's all of that. We only read, read like a third of it, maybe even a quarter of it. And I wanted to read all of, all of it because the story is that one of those earth-shaking events that changes everything in there. So we're going to work up to our reading just here for a second. So there's like this big change that happens, this cataclysmic event. Right? So Peter, it's about Peter, the disciple Peter. We know him. He was a pretty good guy, except for the whole denying thing, right? He is a pretty, he was a pretty good guy. I mean, he denied Jesus three times, but he was good. But it's good news for Peter is that Christ is risen. And Jesus names and restores Peter. We talked about that in the confession. But this one day, this one day. Peter, he goes to bed hungry, which is probably his first problem, right? He goes to bed hungry, and he has this wild dream. He has this dream that is like, oh my goodness, I mean, have you ever had a dream like that? Maybe it was because you went to bed hungry or had some spicy food or something. Like, I don't know. Like that, that's, but that, that's, he has this wild dream, and his dream is that there are hooved animals, and there are pigs, and there's lobsters, and scallops, and all these things that are coming down out of the heavens, coming down like sheets onto the ground. Now, was Peter allowed to eat any of that stuff? No. Not allowed to eat any of it. And then, and so Jesus appears and looks at Peter when he's having this dream. He says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. That's chapter 10, verse 13. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter, being a good Hebrew, being a good Hebrew, he clutches his pearls. He's like, no, not me. I can never do that. I'm a good Hebrew. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. I can never have a pulled pork slider. I can never have bacon wrapped scallops. I could never, all that stuff is unclean and common. I, you, Jesus, you know that I'm better. Sure, I've denied you in the past, but we've moved beyond that. There is forgiveness. But but you know, I'm better than that, Jesus. I'm called for a higher calling. And then Jesus says this. And I want you to remember this phrase. Jesus says this to him. What God has made clean, do not call common. Okay? What God has made clean, do not call common. Oh, that's great. And God, and God says it to him three times in that story. Three times what God has made clean, do not call common. Like, that's great. Like, that's... Pulled pork sliders for everybody, right? Christ is risen. That means when you get home this afternoon, you can have that honey baked ham. Yeah, right? You can have those pulled pork sliders. You can have the rack of pork ribs, right? You can have all of that. And if your A game is going today for your, for your Easter family dinner or lunch, you can have a filet wrapped in bacon. That's only if it's, you got your A game going, though. I don't know if this is an A-game crowd, but, but that's, he has this dream, and then Peter wakes up. He wakes up from the dream. He's like, boy, that's weird. That's really odd. And right as he wakes up, there's a knock at the door. 
<laughs> I appreciate the laugh. <laughs> That's, the, there's a knock at his door. And, he, and he's like, oh, what, what, is, uh, what was that? Like, and he, he goes to the door. And when he opens it, the guy's like, hey, you know, I'm a servant for, for um, so, oh, I'm forgetting the dude's name, Cornelius. I'm, for, I'm the servant for Cornelius, who is a Roman centurion. He's a, basically a Roman general. Now, as soon as you hear Roman centurion or Roman general, there's something you got to do in your mind. Because to be put in there, you got to be like, mmm, boo, right? I don't, I don't like these people. Because Rome is the occupying nation in Judea. Judea are not a free people. They are people that are being held by Rome, by the empire of Rome, by Caesar. And this guy's job, Cornelius' job, is to keep the peace. Basically, keep them from rebelling. Keep the rebels from having insurrections, right? Like all, all, of those, all of those things. That's what his job is to do. So, you know, like Peter's probably not a big fan of his at all. And uh, he would never even live at Cornelius' house. He'd never go over to Cornelius' house. Would never have a meal with him. Never do any of those things. In fact, it was against the law to have a meal with Cornelius. None of that stuff would have happened. But something interesting happened. Cornelius, he also believes in God. He believes in Jesus. He believes in the resurrected Lord because Christ is risen. And, and he believes in all that. And, and he also has a dream. And in that dream, he's, he is told to go get Peter and tell him to come to his house. So Peter wakes from his dream where the Lord says, pulled pork sliders for everybody. Honey baked ham all around, right? And he goes, and the servant of Cornelius is like, Can you come over to the house? So Peter does that. Peter does that. Remember, he's not supposed to be there. And imagine what you can imagine this scene. Have you ever been somewhere that is just like really awkward that you're there? As a pastor, that's pretty common for me. Walk into someone's house, never been to before, and that people are expecting me to say miraculous things out of my voice. Out of, out of my mouth, like I, like I have no ability to do that, right? And they, and so he, he, uh, he's, you know, he's standing, standing there, and you can imagine being in the living room, right in front of him is Cornelius, and standing there, the you know Roman, Roman general, just to the side is probably the secretary, that's standing there, watching, judging, writing down notes and stuff like. He's like, ooh, I don't like that side. Then over on this side, there's like a couch. And there's like two Roman, uh, Roman officers, right? Both acting as guards, eating pulled pork sandwiches on the couch, right? Like they're, they're, over, they're over there. And this is what Peter walks into. He's like, ooh, over here. And he says something interesting. He cuts through the, the awkwardness of the entire situation. He cuts through it right away. He says this. This is verse 28 of chapter 10. You are well aware that it is against the law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown to me that I should not call... All right, now, before I go for any further, before I go any further, what was that dream about? Like sheets of unclean food, and Jesus was saying, you can now have honey-baked ham, you can have the filet with the bacon wrapped around it, Peter. What I have called... Clean is not common anymore. It is now clean, right? He said that. So this is what Peter says to them. Addressing the whole thing, he goes, but God has shown me, it's talking about that vision, that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. Peter realizes what that vision was about. It was never about the bacon, although that was kind of what it was about. You can eat anything. But he realizes is that it, was, it wasn't about the what of salvation. What do I have to do to inherit eternal life? It was about the who the entire time. It's like that you should not call anyone impure or unclean. It's not about the bacon. It's about the people. And this is the message of Easter. Because I think many times you and I we struggle with feeling like we're worthy enough, that we're clean enough, 
that we're good enough, that we're trying to get, get to the point where it's like, I've, I can finally have the answers, right? I finally know which way to go, right? Like that's, and it's our sinful nature oftentimes is that when we are worried about ourselves, we begin to compare to other people, right? We, we, have, we have like Susie over here. We look at her and like, oh my goodness, Susie, she has been at church every day this week. She, she, was, she was outside here at 4.45 this morning setting up breakfast, right? Like Susie was doing all these things. Susie does all this stuff outside of church. All this, I could never be like that. And you're just like, oh my goodness, I'm such a sinner compared to Susie, right? Like that, that's, I'm so, oh, I can't do that. But then you start thinking about Billy Bob over there. And you're like, Billy Bob's got some sin in his life. Like I, I know, I know where the bodies are buried with Billy Bob over there. Like and like is and and it becomes like a bear thing. Like this is one of my favorite jokes because I think it rings true in a lot of circumstances. Is like when you're running from a bear, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just have to be faster than your friend, right? <laughs> Like, and so I think, we, I think we, a lot of times, we put ourselves in that, in that category where we're like, I may not be no Susie level, but I ain't no Billy Bob level either, right? And so I'll, maybe I can just sneak into those pearly gates, right? Like, and we begin to compare and contrast and go, this is good and this is bad. And, and maybe I can just squeak in. And this, that's the thing is when we're worried about squeaking in, we begin to show favoritism to certain groups. We're like, these are the people that look like me, sound like me, do things like me, and these people aren't, thereby these people are bad. They believe different things than I do, so they are unclean and unkempt for and, un- and bad, right? We, and we do, these, we do these comparisons because we have to feel better about ourselves. So we move it over, over there, we're like, oh, those people over there, there's, ah, I just don't, I don't like them very much. We show favoritism. Now we're at the very first verse of our reading from Acts. Now, the ESV says a really weird word. It says, and God showed no partiality. Who uses the word partiality in their everyday language? Nobody. Why in the world is a modern translation using that word? The NIV translation uses this word, and I love it so much more. Peter stands up in front of Cornelius and everybody. After he addresses the situation and how awkward it is, he goes, I realize that God does not show favoritism. That God doesn't show any favoritism. Christ is risen, right? He's risen. Yeah. yeah. That, and then he tells the gospel story. He begins the gospel story with saying, God shows no favoritism over anybody else. He doesn't show any favoritism. And, and, he, and, he, and he goes and he tells about Jesus, how he was baptized, and he did all these ceilings and signs showing that he was miraculous and amazing. Like, and then he came and he died. But he rose again. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Then it all began with no favoritism. And Peter is saying this. Peter, who denied Jesus, and it's written down for us all to read 2,000 years later. I hope none of my mistakes are being read 2,000 years later, right? And God raised Jesus from the dead and forgave Peter. So, so, I don't know where you are today. I don't know where you are in your, in your soul, in your spirits, and how you're feeling about how things are going, how much you're holding on, or how much prideful you actually are, right? But what I hope and pray today is that that same spirit of our resurrected Lord that came in a vision to Peter, that came in a vision to Cornelius, that Roman general, that that he will come to you so that you can feel within every fiber of your personhood that you and that your neighbor and that guy two doors down from you that mows his lawn at 7 o'clock in the morning, that he is loved and that God has declared him clean that he has declared you clean. Because remember what Jesus told Peter about those pulled pork sliders and the bacon wrapped fillets and the bacon wrapped scallions and all that stuff, right? He says, what God has made clean, do not call common. And that you 
God has declared you clean. And you are not common. Because why? Why would we call common anything that, made, that God made clean? So you are loved. You are forgiven. Because Christ is risen. Let's say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much that you rose from the dead for us. And Lord, let us within the midst of our soul know that you have declared us clean. Let us in the midst of our soul know that you have declared our enemy clean, that you have declared all nations clean. And so we can rejoice in you that you have forgiven the entire world. Amen.